In patients with congenital anemias, like severe beta thalassemia, it's clear that iron is a major contributor to morbidity and mortality. If you don't adequately chelate patients with severe transfusion-dependent thalassemia, most of them will die in their teenage years or adolescent or, or teenage years or 20s or 30s of uh, complications of cirrhosis of the liver, uh, liver cancer uh, induced by iron overload, uh, cardiac uh, defects, both uh, cardiomyopathy and electrical conduction problems. And less commonly, iron can also affect other tissues like the pituitary gland or um, uh, the joints. Uh, but um, in MDS, it's not clear how those risks of iron overload compare with other risks of the disease, like disease progression due to increased blasts or infection, which is the most common cause of death in patients with MDS. Although a low white count is the main driver of infection, iron could potentially contribute to infection in some situations. Many organisms are what's called siderophoric, which means that they grow well in an iron-rich environment. So somebody with iron overload would be more likely to have certain types of fungal infections or bacterial infections. But balancing all of those risks is somewhat challenging. And so uh, MDS, because it is a cancer, it is neoplasm, it's a different situation from the inherited condition, the congenital beta thalassemia. I think the difference between MDS and a disease like thalassemia or some of the other inherited uh, inborn anemias is, is really twofold. One is that you know, these other disorders are not neoplasms, they're not clonal disorders. So you know, the anemia and the iron are the major complications of the disease. So you're not thinking about how does this fit in with the other potential problems that my, my patient could have. Those patients tend to be much younger as well, so they often don't have a lot of other medical problems the way that our patients with MDS, whose median age is about 71 years, have. The other difference is that um, in thalassemia in particular, there seems to be an innate drive uh, of the gut to absorb iron uh, due to the ineffective erythropoiesis in the bone marrow. And that seems to be a little bit less so in MDS. Most of the iron overload in MDS is things that we do to the patients. It's iatrogenic from blood transfusions. Not all of it. There is some overlap certainly in the pathophysiology, but um, it is a little bit distinct from thalassemia. And so some of the strategies that might be effective for thalassemia to turn that drive off are going to be less helpful in MDS. The evidence for iron as a risk in MDS is strongest for the lower risk disease types. That's partly because they tend to live longer, so they have more chance over time to accumulate excess iron. And also, it's a matter of competing risks. In the high risk disease, in the patients with refractory anemia with excess blasts or complex chromosomes, the disease itself moves so swiftly that patients don't really have time to develop some of the complications of iron overload that may transpire only over years. And so this is primarily a risk for patients with lower risk disease. In fact, nobody's been able to show that iron, at least measured by serum ferritin levels, matters in higher risk disease. So we're mostly talking about patients with refractory anemia. Interestingly, you'd expect patients with the MDS subtype refractory anemia with ring sideroblasts, or RARS, to run into the biggest problem with iron because they um, have an intrinsic defect in how their red blood cells process iron. However, the RARS population seems to be a little bit special in that people have not been able to show consistently that serum ferritin predicts outcomes in those patients. And uh, iron uh, overload seems to develop at a little bit of a different rate in them than we might expect. There's lots of other factors that determine how quickly iron accumulates in a patient. Uh, 
it's very common, especially in people of Irish or other Northern European descent, to have a mutation in a gene called HFE, uh, which uh, contributes to hereditary hemochromatosis and promotes iron loading. It promotes accumulation of iron such that somebody who has one of these mutations in HFE is, is going to start at the time of diagnosis already with mild or moderate overload or at least predisposed to, to get that. Whereas if you have someone who is iron deficient because they bleeding or because in a woman uh, she's only recently stopped menstruating, then um, it's going to take longer for such a person to accumulate iron. The rate at which transfusions are given matters too, so that if you're someone who gets a transfusion once every six to eight weeks, you're much more slow to accumulate iron than someone who is getting two units of blood every week. Uh, so there is a general correlation with the total number of red blood cell units administered. But it's not perfect. There are people who've had 15 to 20 units of blood who already have substantial iron overload. There are people who've had 150 units of red cells who have minimal iron overload. So everybody's a little bit different, which makes it challenging for us to think about who would be candidates for chelation therapy.